I'm Rolaika Roach and welcome to the live Council of Ministers press briefing for today, Wednesday, June 13th, 2018. At this time, I invite the Minister of Justice and Acting Minister of Transport, Telecommunication, Economic Affairs and Tourism, the Honorable Cornelius De Weaver, to address you. Minister De Weaver. Good morning, thank you, Ms. Roach, fellow colleague ministers to the media. Good morning, St. Martin. I have a few announcements for this week. You know, I try as much as possible to keep everyone informed, so the press releases are constantly coming. But of course, we always have to keep you informed as other developments. And one of them is the small claims court procedure, uh, which is actually there but not being used very frequently. And it appears that the public is not aware of the possibilities or find it difficult to start a procedure even though the costs are low and the formalities are greatly reduced. A standard form is being drafted and will be available through the court's website in English, Dutch, and Papimento. We are, the, we are also looking at other languages possibilities, but that one has not been finalized as yet. And these um, forms will be able to find, file the claim. These forms will be available hopefully in September and it will be available on the website. The Office of the Khrifi at the courthouse will also be able to assist individuals with filling out these forms and procedures as well. I want to thank Mr. Peter Lemire, the Vice President of the Joint Court, for assisting me with this project as well because it has been a burning issue within the community. I know it was also an agenda point for the Prime Minister during her term in Parliament, and to see that we have it and we can use it is extremely important. Because the present Red Bull von Burkelke Rechtsvordering provides an easy access procedure for claims up to 10,000 gillers. The court fee is low, 50 gillers, and normally 15% of the sum claim varying from a minimum of 50 gillers, and it can go up to 7,500 gillers. The procedure is active accessible for both natural persons as well as for companies, and no lawyers are required. The Clifford sends a copy of the claim to the debtor. The debtor has three weeks to respond to the claim. If he fails to do so or she fails to do so, or if there's no substantive defense, the judge will issue a verdict. Otherwise, in case of the debtor defense himself with the him or herself with a material argument, the judge orders a court session for both parties to explain their arguments to the judge. During this session, an amicus settlement can be reached. If not, a verdict would be rendered in six weeks. This again is an outline of the procedure and I hope that the community take notes of it and for small claims that they are able to save some money as well as settle any potential conflict. Uh, July 1st is also approaching, the deadline for the number plates. I, have, I know Minister of Finance has also mentioned it a couple of times. I just want to reiterate it as well. Um, you know, the leniency was granted and it was, I know, very appreciated. I've been stopped by many people and thanking me for giving that break. Um, but I also need them to do their part and comply with the July 1st deadline. Just a quick update, American Airlines as well has started um, has increased the seats on, our, on the daily flights during the summer. So it, the capacity is now at 160 passengers, which should mean more business for St. Martin. On November 4th, there will be a new flight from Charlotte. We're looking forward to that one as well. That's one of the things we had discussed when we met with them as well. And in December, on December 19th, there will be three flights coming from Miami. So. We're gearing up for the season. I want us all to stay vigilant. I want us to stay productive, and I want us to be ready for the season. I'm asking everyone to do their share as well. These are my announcements for today, and I await any questions you may have. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Ms. Roach. Thank you, Minister De Weaver, for your opening remarks. At this time, I invite the Minister of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sport, the Honorable Yurin White, to address you. Minister Weiter.
Thank you, Rolaika, and good morning to the members of the press, my colleagues, everybody listening in. A pleasant good morning, pleasant Wednesday. And uh, as I've stressed on, on numerous occasions, of course, recovery and resiliency will continue to be the theme of this interim governing period. And while a number of initiatives are aimed at repairing and restoring what was lost in the storms of last years, we are now indeed focusing on disaster preparedness trainings and indeed the continued repairs of schools, the continued repairs of, repairs of sports facilities. I've been informed, for instance, that the Dutch Quarter basketball court is advancing and that the Middle Region basketball court is also ready and to commence uh, the repairs so dearly needed so that our young people have sufficient activities to engage in in their respective districts. Now, last week, as, as minister, I was also able to partake in a variety of activities that each, in their own way, showed how strong we are, therefore, as a people, and how we do not let adversity hold us back or keep us down. Um, I was able to visit, for instance, the Prince Willem Alexander School and take part in an I Step presentation where I was able to witness firsthand our advancement in 21st century learning with school children of Teacher Stewart and Teacher for Wards classes, and they gave demonstrations on how technologies was used in answering multiplication, multiplication and division problems related to math. Technology is ever advancing, and we must continue to utilize whatever tools necessary to teach our 21st century children. The ISTEP program is a needed initiative, and I look forward to its advancement in our classrooms and schools, especially in this case, the public schools. I was so pleased and therefore also excited to especially see students with learning challenges engaging learning through technology, and some teachers mentioned that students actually challenged before are now fully engaged and participating in learning and therefore advancing with their possibilities to have gainful uh, employment and, and opportunities in life. I also attended last week the final games on, of the Interscholastic Primary School Water Polo Co Championships. I use this opportunity to congratulate the students of the Hillside Christian School on a well-deserved victory, which I witnessed, and all the schools that participated. The hashtag Sports Matter campaign continues to be close to my heart, and I recognize the importance of all the various display of sport activities that continue to be carried out on a daily basis, and I encourage everyone, volunteers, schools, sports associations, federations to continue and keep the good word up, work up. Therefore, I would also like to use the opportunity on behalf of the Department of Sport to highlight two sport, fitness and health, healthy lifestyle businesses on the island that the registration drive for the expo section of its fourth annual sports open house is now open. The theme of this year's event is, of course, hashtag Sports Matter. And the open house is set to take place on Friday, August 24th, and Saturday, August 25th, 2018, at the Raoul Illich Sports Complex. And I would like to urge all relevant organizations to participate in this wonderful event. Rounding off a busy week, I was also able to surprise the winner of the Too Cool to Loot logo contest hosted by UNICEF and my ministry. The winner, again, is Mrs. Uh, Kochi Quetzal, Lee Gonzalez Toro, and she was also the winner of this year's Culture Prize. She's a student of the Charlotte Brookson Academy. Um, she's displayed extraordinary talent, and the Culture Department recognized her with her ability to indeed present and design the logo for the, the campaign. Um, right in line with the concept of equipping ourselves and strengthening the capacity of St. Martin and its citizens, I'm very pleased to disclose that in yesterday's Council of Ministers meeting, the approval for the principal agreement to pursue the long-awaited law faculty program on St. Martin, offered by the University of Curaçao, received its support. In May, I had a report commissioned to study the feasibility of starting the law prog program at the University of St. Martin as early as September 2018. The study was executed and the report written by Dr. Rhoda Arendel, who has been involved in the earlier stages of the exploration and feasibility of the program as well. 
The objectives of the program stems from the assignment given, of course, by the then Minister of Finance to finalize the feasibility study on a law program on St. Martin in cooperation with the said university in Curaçao. However, due to the passage of Hurricane Irma, the execution of the program was halted and has been picked up by my person and revisited. The goal remains to produce a team of homegrown lawyers through a Dutch Caribbean law program and offer more opportunities, therefore, for lifelong learning and higher education on island. I have emphasized on many occasions my belief for education as an important strategy for social and economic development, and this is therefore a prime example. The report submitted by Dr. Arundel gave advice regarding the objectives of the law program and the initial proposed pre-law program. I prefer not to pursue the route of an established so-called law foundation uh, to execute the program and would like to see whether we can simplify and have effective, st minimal, strong organizations. And in this case, of course, the University of Curaçao has the accreditation of a very, very critical uh, program and we would explore and they are requested to assist us also in the development and strengthening of our own capabilities to have this program executed. The initial pro proposal for the law program at the University of St. Martin was therefore for two interconnected programs. As I mentioned, the pre-law program offered therefore by USM and a bachelor and master of law program, BA and MA, offered by the University of Curaçao. Now, as mentioned, the BAMA program will be executed by them, and this means that students in St. Martin have to meet the same requirements for admission into the BAMA program as the students in Curaçao, because this part-time program will start simultaneously in September on Curaçao and on St. Martin. The students, therefore, need to possess a FAVIO diploma from an institution within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, or equivalent, possess a HAVO diploma along with a first year uh, HBO or bachelor uh, training, possess a HAVO or a CXC CSEC or an O-level diploma along with the entrance exam on the level of um, colloquium doctum, and other requirements are necessary such as the staats examen. Another alternative could be that if we have the pre-law program in effect, that that could be then also a qualifier to enroll in the bachelor or master degree program. Um, even though we will start, therefore, with a law program in September, uh, the University of Curaçao and University of St. Martin are in consultation to indeed review and prepare for options to start a pre-law program in January 2019. Uh, the budget for the proposed program would come from the Ministry of Finance under a budget post that was set up by the former minister and especially therefore created for this project. And I'm very happy to have received the blessing of my colleague Minister Mike Ferrier and the entire Council of Ministers for this uh, support as we all dearly recognize possibilities for socio-economic activity and this further strengthening of USM. Uh, we will have the remaining cost to start up this year taken from that budget post and hopefully in the near future then the necessary transfers will happen to ensure that sufficient funds are available on the Ministries of Education, Culture, Youth and Sport program. Therefore, I'm thanking the Secretary General of the Ministry, uh, Dr. Roda Arendel, Dr. Goudappel from the University of Curaçao, for their preparatory work, for their partnership, their consultations, and I wish them also success because we're now going to engage in a further advice, a second uh, agreement that will therefore reflect the final service level agreement to be reached and to be signed off. But with this preliminary principal agreement, we have been able to confirm that we're able to keep matters within the available budget, and we are then able to also indeed start the first initial marketing uh, and set up preparations in consultation with all parties, such as also the University of St. Martin. Yeah, this is um, what I would like to share, and I'm of course open for further questions from the press. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Weitzer, for your opening remarks. At this time, I invite the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, the Honorable Michael Ferrier, to address you. Minister Ferrier. Good morning, members of the press, colleagues, 
St. Martin is wherever you are in the hemisphere in the universe. It's a great day in St. Martin. We're having a good time. And no, I'm not the deputy prime minister. I'm just the oldest minister. And since the prime minister is off island and the deputy prime minister is off island, the law says the oldest guy takes over. At 68, I'm dictator for a day. <laughs> oh, well, a couple hours. Yeah, she's coming back today. So, anyhow, um, it's uh, quite a privilege to serve St. Martin. Um, the issue that I'd like to just uh, bring to your attention today is um, our monetary unit. As you know, we have a, we're still using the um, Antillian Gilder, the Netherlands Antillian Gilder. Uh, back in 101010, the um, Central Bank of Curacao and St. Martin was uh, established basically when we had the two countries uh, emerge from the change of our uh, kingdom setup. And um, we have a situation with regards to the, uh, uh, what, what monetary unit are we going to use. Um, based on existing legislation, uh, the country, St. Martin, could continue using uh, the old Netherlands Antillian Florin, the old Netherlands Antillian Gilde, which we're all so familiar with. However, we have some issues coming up. Um, as you know, um, for one thing, um, banknotes, um, they tend to get destroyed, they tend to get uh, um, to a condition where they cannot be used anymore, so they need to be taken out of circulation. Um, there is a, right now, there is a, 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 a supply of approximately two years left at the normal rate of uh, attrition, normal rate of, of, of old banknotes being taken out. And so a decision has to be taken if we are going to print more uh, have more replacement uh, uh, banknotes made. Um, but that brings a couple of questions. One, um, we have a monetary unit with Curacao right now. Question is, will that continue for a long, long time yet, or will we decide to do something different? Um, if we continue with Curacao, which right now it looks that that's the way it is, but it's being evaluated. Are we going to take a look at how, how to go on about that? Uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers made a, uh, a report in 2014, I believe, in which they uh, also suggested that an evaluation should take place whether or not um, Curacao and St. Martin should continue in a monetary unit or not. But let's take that we will continue if that's the case. Um, then we need to decide what are we going to do about the Gilder. Uh, we cannot continue uh, with um, printing the Netherlands Antillian Gilder anymore simply because uh, there's some technical issues with that. One is the, um, the uh, ability to forge, to make forgeries out of the present uh, um, um, banknotes seems to be technologically um, possible. And so they'd have to upgrade that uh, technology. And to do that, it seems to be extremely expensive. So that's one of the technical aspects of, do we want to invest more money in just upgrading a currency that eventually will have to uh, disappear? There's talk about a Caribbean Gilder. And to, do, to, make, to get that arrangement made, uh, like I said, we need to determine first, are we going to continue with Curacao as a monetary unit, in a monetary unit? And, um, and if so, we need to then uh, decide what are we going to do? Are we going to have a Caribbean Gilder? Are we going to dollarize? Are we going to euroize? Whatever it is that we're going to do will need to be um, determined. So I've started... Um, uh, well, I've started. The contact has been made between myself and my colleague in Curacao, the Minister of Finance, and we are starting up that conversation as soon as possible because we need to make a decision as soon as possible with regards to where we're going and what we're going to do. Um, so that's the most important item that I wanted to mention to you, um, beside the fact that uh, as a uh, I mentioned earlier, 
I am dictator for a day, so watch out. Oh no, it's for a few hours, I was told. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you, Minister Ferrier, for your opening remarks. If you've just joined us, you are watching the live Council of Ministers press briefing. Thank you for joining us. We now go on to the question and answer session. Hilbert Haar of St. Martin News Online, you have the floor. Minister Ferrier, uh, about the monetary union. I seem to remember that quite some years ago, the Social Economic Council uh, issued an advice that basically said, get the hell out of the monetary union because it's not beneficial to St. Martin. What is the, the current thought about that issue? Uh, tell you the truth, uh, Hilbert, we have not really um, spent a whole lot of time on that uh, issue. As I said, it just came to my desk again uh, this week um, based on conversations I've had with my colleague in Curacao. And um, the urgency was uh, brought forward again simply because we are running out of uh, the supply of, of, of present uh, uh, currency. Um, but um, it will be brought back to the Council of Ministers so we can, uh, th this is a discussion that we must have now because time is starting to press. And like I said, we have uh, two year, a two year uh, uh, supply left. And so I hope that within the next three, maximum six months, a decision can be made as to which way we're gonna go with this. Uh, Stephen Cerulean of PJD2 Radio, you have the floor. Ministers, good morning. First of all, I want to say um, good luck to our colleague, Hilbert Ha, who will be leaving us shortly. Good luck to you. Uh, Minister of Education, the um, pre-law program, you said that this will be financed by the Ministry of Finance. How much has been budgeted for this program? Thank you for your question, uh, Steve. Um, first of all, to correct you slightly, uh, I believe I mentioned that we are going to start with a law program in September 2018 in collaboration and therefore executed under the supervision of the University of Curacao. That's the first step. The associated costs have been analyzed, reviewed, but they uh, relate to an entire academic year. So we will now bring it down to the cost associated for the remainder of this year, being there for September, October, November, and December, and indeed the startup cost. Overall, the expenditures are expected to be, be way below um, three to four hundred thousand dollars for this remaining year, and for an entire year, approximately five hundred thousand dollars. But don't hold me to that because we are crunching those final numbers and these are the first uh, sincerely prepared and well prepared um, budgets by the University of Curacao but we will now break it down to what are the costs for the remaining of budget year 2018 and which are the costs that will roll over for budget year 2019 which is relevant. In addition to that as you mentioned and you indeed maybe misunderstood associated with the pre-law uh, program we will also further consult and engage in a conversation with the University of St. Martin because I have been informed that the pre-law program would possibly be executed by the University of St. Martin itself and then could function as a qualifier to enroll in a bachelor program and a master degree program, which of course have to meet the standards and uh, the recognition in order to be called lawyer in the Dutch Kingdom. Yeah? Alita Singh of the Daily Herald. Thank you, Alika. Good morning, uh, Prime Minister, for a few hours and <laughs> more. And Minister De Weaver, Minister Weta. My question is for Minister De Weaver. It has to do with border protection. We have received several uh, complaints uh, from especially business people not holding the Dutch nationality that either have residency on either side of the island or they have businesses here. When they're coming in via the, the airport, they're being uh, heavily questioned. Uh, I've, I've had two incidences where business people, um, that it can be shown from their passports that they have come here frequently, they were asked, for instance, um, do you have pictures of your apartment? One of them actually owned, owns property here. Um, we need to see that. I do understand that there is, um, and I think they also understand that there's a need for better border protection, but it's also seen as them being very harassed, especially um, 
uh, by the Dutch uh, border protection officers that are here. Uh, two of the um, people that were harassed, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm being a little long, but I need to explain it, um, of course, uh, have uh, names that are in other parts of the world would be considered um, you know, suspicious, uh, so to speak. Uh, so they felt, at least one, mem one gentleman felt very discriminated against um, coming in. You spoke about flights coming in, us building back better and doing uh, business, et cetera. This is not a good impression for people that are bringing money into us. Have you also had similar um, complaints? Um, and I or, and um, if yes, how is this being dealt with? Thank you very much for your question, Ms. Singh. I have, I'm aware of one situation that was brought to my attention. It was referred to the head of immigration, the good lady, to handle this situation according to the laws of the committee. Now, there was supposed to be a committee that should have been established before. Um, that never was. So we have started to establish that, process, that committee so that any complaint that comes in will be handled in the correct manner. So we've asked this committee based on, well, we've asked the head of the department to handle this complaint as if it was part of the committee so that we can start preparing to establish that committee to handle any complaint through that, um, through that department. Uh, the timeline for it, we started yesterday, technically speaking, because it came to my desk yesterday uh, because I've been traveling for the CTO Caribbean Week in New York as well as the PAMA conference, because next year we will be hosting the PAMA conference in St. Martin. So we're looking forward to that, and we had to announce that in Punta Cana. And uh, they came to my desk yesterday. So we started yesterday. The email went out, uh, I believe, on Monday uh, to the good lady at the immigration department, and we're busy working on it now. Thank you. Lyndon Brown of BCN TV, you have the floor. Good morning to the people of St. Martin and to the ministers that are present. And to minister for a couple of hours. Congratulations. <laughs> a lot of the time, um, Minister Mike Ferry, the people feel that, the people of St. Martin feel that they have been targeting. We have seen it on the, in the paper Monday, the, uh, the front page of one of our, of the manager <laughs> of the harbor. Um, let, can you let the people of St. Martin know who exactly um, over the harbor? Because um, it seems like everything is, is um, directing in one direction. And, and uh, the harbor is a government-owned company, okay? Uh, thank you. I will um, allow uh, the Minister of Teat, under whose um, the domain, the harbor falls, answer that. The port falls under the uh, shareholder rep, under the Ministry of TIAD, Tourism, Economic Affairs, Transportation, and Telecommunications. So I'm the one that has been involved with the board as well as management to address a lot of these issues. One including which was the inquiry, and as you know that that investigation has been going on for two years they have had full cooperation from the management of the port. Um, in addition, if they appoint anyone for the inquiry, the port would have to pay for it, and it could come up to over half a million dollars. So we're definitely, that's one of the reasons why we were very reserved about getting involved in the inquiry at all, because for two years of an investigation and having all the documentation, technically there was no need for an inquiry. That was uh, the position of the shareholder at the time, and uh, we maintained that. <coughs> Um, I, I don't believe in anyone being targeted. Um, you know, the prosecutors have their job to do, and uh, they are executing it. And like I mentioned in my opening statement in court, as the Minister of Justice, I did not believe in interfering in any kind of investigation and let that course be taken. Hilbert Haar, you have the floor. Okay, uh, Minister Vouta. Uh, your predecessor took a decision about uh, the financial support for the university, and I think that covered like their cost for three months or so, if I remember correctly. What is the current financial situation of the university? Did you follow up? Did they get more money? Because I don't hear anything that they are on the abyss at the moment. 
I will make sure that indeed further information and details will follow as we are now advancing in the month of June. And uh, of course, in the meantime, uh, in, in line with the memorandum of understanding that was agreed upon in December, the um, uh, University of St. Martin was requested to submit their subsidy and submit a business plan, which are currently being consulted also together with the, 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 the legislation for higher education. So those matters have been um, submitted, but are currently being reviewed. Of course, the University of St. Martin has received funding throughout the lab previous years and this year as well. But the additional funds that were uh, made available indeed came to an end in the fir first quarter and are now awaiting the finalizations of the reviews and the audits that are also currently taking place with the university and the SOAB. So I'm sure that once conclusions are there, we can indeed properly inform the members of the, of the media for the course forward. But as I've mentioned, once, of course, the University of St. Martin further expands its program, it will become a more sustainable and strong institution within, uh, within our society. Thank you, Minister. Stephen Cerulean. Minister of Culture. Um, July 1st, Emancipation Day is fast approaching. What are some of the planned activities for the observation of the day in question? And how much has been budgeted for the overall day of activities? Thank you for the question, um, uh, Steve. We are advancing with the preparations. I received a, a brief elucidation and a briefing by the Department of Culture. I think it's uh, fitting and, and um, appropriate to have a more extensive preparation made through a press release with a breakdown of all the activities that are anticipated. There were, uh, will be slight changes in comparison to the previous years, but I would allow the Department of Culture to be specific instead of highlighting a couple of them and then make, maybe making mistakes. Overall, we don't have a specific separate budget for Emancipation Day set out, but we have an overall budget of approximately 250, 300,000 guilders for a variety of observances, such as, for instance, sometimes more funds that need to go to St. Martin Day observations that de depends on whether we are the organizers or whether it's the French side, and every year also for St. Martin, uh, for Emancipation Day and other um, activities and observances and national holidays as well. Yeah, so we, I will promise that we will prepare a press release with a further breakdown so that everybody can further participate in activities that we are preparing. Thank you, Minister. Alita Singh. Thank you again, Rulaika. Again to the Minister of Justice, could you give a further explanation about that committee that you mentioned earlier, who would sit on that committee? Um, and you mentioned that it was the Immigration Department. Uh, isn't there a difference between immigration and border protection? Just to be clear on that and, and so that people know also in the future how the committee functions and how they can uh, file complaints, et cetera. If you give me one minute, I'll try to look up the complaint. <laughs> but can we just come back to that in a sure. second? We can go ahead with the next question okay, and sure. I'll try to look it up. Okay, Lyndon Brown. Quick question to the Minister of Education. There was um, ongoing fury in the PSBE school. Has this matter came to your desk? And um, so far, there was some discussion with lawyers. Were you present to resolve this matter at the school, seeing that education is a priority? Thank you for the question, Mr. Brown. The uh, answer is simple, no. I was not present in any type of consultations, which is considered primarily a first internal school matter. A PSV is a private foundation run by a school board, and therefore the school board is in their first initiative to handle these type of internal matters. Of course, we have uh, a system with the inspectorate of education that will supervise there for the matter if there would be any type of incidents that require my attention, I will then indeed receive the report. Yeah? So I did not receive the report on my desk, I believe you literally asked as yet. So I'm sure that the inspectorate of education is further involved in this matter. Well, it's a concern. 
any incident or matter related uh, that would indeed negatively impact education could be a concern and, uh, and should have the attention of the appropriate authorities. And in this case, that's the Inspectorate of Education who have an advisory role and also an intervening role in the educational system. Ministers don't have to get involved in each individual case until they are requested to do so. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you, Minister Weite. Minister De Weaver, are you able to answer Mrs. Ms. Singh's question? No, but I can definitely try to Sorry. No, but I can definitely try to provide the answers by this afternoon and send it out in a press release so that everyone is aware. Thank you. Sorry. My apologies. Thank you, Minister De Weaver. Hilbert Haar? Yeah. Something completely different. Um, uh, the hurricane has uh, damaged a lot of uh, uh, monuments uh, in St. Martin. One of them, I noticed that uh, the statue of uh, Juan Teteluque is gone from that, uh, that roundabout. Do you have uh, a budget uh, to restore those monuments and, and, and how are you going about that? Yeah, I'm happy that you bring it to my attention, also to alert myself. You know, there, there, there are days and weeks that you're overwhelmed with some other priorities and Unfortunately, the, 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 the matter of, the, of, of, of statues are, first of all, no recognized monuments. Huh? They were placed, developed, they're relatively new, huh? over developed and uh, designed over the last five to ten years. And it has often been an initiative by the Ministry of Vromi in their construction of, for instance, roundabouts. So the question of the, the position of the statutes, its value and its replacement and maintenance are indeed a matter that have to be addressed between the Department of Culture and the Ministry of Vromi. Um, whether funds are there for us set aside, we have to look at it because we have to also not only consider Wantete Loke, but also, of course, the, the, the salt uh, uh, statues here in the roundabout in front of, of the police station should also be looked into. So I don't. I know it has our attention, and uh, I ha haven't recently been informed uh, to see if there would be any type of clarity whether it would be carried by the Ministry of Vromi or whether it has to be carried by the Ministry of Culture. But statues are an important symbol, important value to our identity and culture. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Minister Weitzer. Stephen Cerulean. If I may, if I may just add to yes, that. Minister. Note, um, from, I think from a St. Martin point of view, if I may, um, those statutes, we will find budget for them someplace because it is important. It is important that we restore St. Martin to what it was, at least to what it was before, and then better. And, and those statutes definitely should come back. Um, just like I just want to dovetail into that. Uh, our Prime Minister has been working diligently on um, uh, replacing the flag back on the, um, um, the, the, the point, the, the Colby uh, lookout point, uh, and trying to um, um, organize it this way. In this, th this time, make sure it's done in the correct way. Um, stronger flags have been ordered. I'm not sure if the one that's there today is one of those stronger flags, but definitely stronger flags have been ordered. Um, a change of lighting has been uh, instructed to be put up there because the whole idea is if the flags are going to be up all night, it needs to be properly lit. Um, now, I've seen them uh, installing the new lighting, but right now, as far as I'm concerned, what I can still see is the, the bottom part of the pole is well lit, but the flag itself is not lit quite good yet. So it's a, a work in progress. Another thing that is being done up there is, of course, um, um, it's private property. It's it's owned by the Bell by the Bells, uh, the Bell uh, family. We um, we are still trying to uh, untangle how uh, the whole project came to be, um, but for sure we see tourists walking up and going up to the flagpole. From what we read in the papers at the time when the flag when this project was being put together, it was going to be one of. Uh, when people are standing on the lookout, the existing lookout, and they take pictures with the flag in the background, that's what was the idea was. But what we see is we see tourists walking up and going to the flagpole. And we are concerned about the safety of, of the tourists that walk up there, especially since the flagpole has been put up there. Uh, like I say, we know that it's private property, and so we want to make sure that we uh, you know, let the tourists know that they would be walking up there at, at their own risk. Uh, again, 
Um, the project was put together in a hurry for whatever reason. Uh, we think it's a, a, a great idea to have the flag there, but we are trying and our Prime Minister is endeavoring to straighten out the issues that were left undone when the flag just went up to have a flag up there and not worry about the uh, other items that surround it. Uh, the red light indeed also, um, you know, on the top of it there is a hazard light for, for aircraft um, and, and definitely that light that was up there, um, somebody said, oh, it's in accordance with, uh, with the, 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 the limitation and the rules of, of civil aviation, but as I mentioned before, um, as a pilot myself, I think um, that light was way underpowered. Uh, it should be like the lights that are on the hilltops, as you can see, and the masts all over the place. You see those even, especially in bad weather, you still see them, you see them. And that's the whole idea of letting a pilot know there is something in the way that you want to go around or above or whatever. And uh, that light is also being replaced. So um, uh, for Flag Day, the flag is up, and we are uh, working on uh, improving what should have been done in the first place. Thank you, Minister Ferrier. Stephen Cerulean. Interestingly, the Minister of Finance is addressing the flag when we actually observe in Flag Day. My question is to the Minister of Education. How much uh, is being taught as it pertains to the flag to our youngsters, especially those attending um, the elementary schools to ensure that they are well knowledgeable as to the significance of the flag? Thank you for your question. Um, we have developed, the Department of uh, Education and Innovation has developed a special curriculum related to social sciences and, and, and relevant developments in related to history, symbols of our culture, uh, and that has been designed in special uh, educational material which has been distributed uh, to uh, the various schools, the subsidized schools, the public schools, in order to apply it. How exactly, of course, the various teachers in primary education include it in their lesson programs, I'm not aware of, but the material has significantly been invested in. Monies have been put aside in order to ensure that we are better indeed educated, informed, and take more pride in our own social developments, history, and symbols of our culture. I am going to jump in there also because that again is a very important point. Um, if you're in the United States and they start playing the United States anthem, everybody stops. Most people also cross their heart. If you're in the Dominican Republic, same thing happens. If you're in France, same thing happened. It upsets me to no extent when people on St. Martin and some of our own St. Martins do it as, as well, but mostly people who are not aware of what our St. Martin song is all about. Everybody keeps talking, everybody keeps walking, everybody keeps their hat on, everybody keeps doing whatever they want because in St. Martin, everything is okay, but it's not. The flag is also very important. When we have an, uh, a, a situation, an official uh, presentation of the flag, it should be honored and it must be honored. Our, our national song, it's not our anthem yet, but our national song must be uh, 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 acknowledged by all those that have chosen to come to St. Martin and make St. Martin their home. This is a country that has its flag, has its song, and it needs to be uh, respected. And we, as a, as a St. Martiners, need to show the good example. When the St. Martin song is played, we should stop. We should stop where we are allow it to be played and, and give it the respect. And uh, another peeve of, of mine, I told you I have a couple of hours, I can do this. Um, changing our St. Martin song. There seems to be a new thing when you sing the St. Martin song that you add your own notes to it and, 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 and uh, make it a, a different uh, style. Uh, some people think it's, it's a, I don't know, maybe it's an expression of, of, uh, of how to um, uh, present the St. Martin song, but um, it's my personal, I say it again, my personal opinion that the song 
uh, uh, must not be taken uh, uh, and, and, and changed and, and, and have different sounds to it. Um, I, I, I need to explain that maybe better, but I will find uh, uh, versions that uh, really, uh, according to me, do not do the song justice and uh, the, the, the importance of it. So I think it's important that we look at these items if we're going to have a country that we're all proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Ferrier. Alita Singh. Thanks again, Rulaika. Minister Ferrier, going back to the whole issue of the flagpole, you said uh, when you responded about it that government is still trying to untangle the whole project. Could you give some more insight into what you meant by that? Um, what I mean with that is that we want to make sure that we understand uh, how, it, how, it came, how it came to be. Um, the cost of it, for instance. We had some questions about how much the whole project cost. Um, what is allowed? Every minister has a limit in their, in their, uh, um, that, they're, that they're allowed to spend and how they go about um, getting a project completed. So we're still trying to untangle that, how that all went. Uh, but like I say, there are some items that we believe, and our prime minister is very, uh, uh, um, very strict about these things. Um, when you do something, do it in the correct fashion. Do and, 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 and cover all bases. And in this case, we're talking about uh, access to the flag, uh, private property or not, if government has been involved with that flagpole, somehow or the other we're going to be drawn in if there is a mishap there. So we need to take uh, steps to protect government against liability. Thank you, Minister Ferrier. Lyndon Brown, BCNTV, you have the final question. Minister DeRiva. There are less educational activities that are taking place um, at the prison, and also less of our, our young people are going to prison. It, is this wonderful? Um, things are getting better. Melissa. Your question is? The question is, there are less activity, educational activity at the prison. Um, I understand it is on hold. For that, what reason? That, that and, is uh, correct. Um, and also less of our youngsters are going to prison, which is something to be congratulated for. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, as far as the activities are concerned, the damage sustained at the prison included the work areas, whether it was carpentry or mechanics, uh, upholstery as well. Uh, those areas were damaged, so there, there are less activities. Uh, it's something that we are including in the plan two or the plan of approach for the prison, which is due this week as well. We're going to be sending it on to the Netherlands. The plan is ready. Uh, we were anticipating some more technical assistance from the Netherlands that was promised for the last few months, but that should be coming pretty soon. So. Uh, between today and tomorrow, a letter will be going out to the Minister of Justice in the Netherlands, Mr. Krapperheis, as well as Mr. Knops, uh, informing them of our current status and how we're moving forward, and we look forward to that. Uh, as for, and again, again, even when it comes to building a prison, it is not just the walls and the cells. It's, it involves the rehabilitation. It involves the education. A lot of the rooms where the computers were, for example, all destroyed. So we do have a lot of work to do up there and that's being addressed in the plan for now back the plan of the porch.